an ex-Muslim's guide to Christianity. When you're out and around and hopefully reaching out to folks in our community at Mississippi State or in Starkville, you know, we have a, a growing a population of Muslim and Muslim background folks in our community. I hope you're making those kind of connections. And as you have the opportunities to begin to maybe be invited to share about what Jesus really is about, who he really is, and what your faith is, I commend this book to you, An Ex-Muslim's Guide to Christianity. Uh, in her testimony, Kenza, who grew up in Morocco and then as a teenager moved to California, shares about how determined she was to get everything right as a Muslim young woman, as a Muslim teenager and then a Muslim young woman. That in Islam, you know, for instance, there's all these rules that you have to do so that you might possibly in the future and at the judgment be favored by Allah. And one of the things you just absolutely have to do are the five prayers every day. And Kenza was the kind of person, I don't know if you're like this, you know somebody like this, because you have to do five. She always made sure she did at least seven prayers to make sure she was well over the top and you know, in the good, the, the good student, so to speak, in the whole operation of cause and effect and Allah weighing everything out. Um, but over time, and particularly as a teenager, Kenza said, I, I fell into depression and anxiety because Islam is very much a cause and effect religion. Anything that, that's bad that happens to a person is seen as a condemnation from the God of Islam. She moved to the United States. She needed to really guard herself because there's all kinds of stuff going on in the United States, certainly in California. And her parents were even more restrictive with her as a teenager who had moved to the States. She said, by the age of 23, I was convinced that God hated me. In a way, ironically to me, this sounds a little bit like Martin Luther's testimony, you know, that you get pick up on in, for instance, his preface to his commentary on the book of Romans. She says, I was convinced that God hated me. I remember one night I was sitting on my couch, and based on Islamic rituals, you have to go through all these washing rituals in order to perform prayer. I mean, you don't just pray, you perform prayer. You better be cleansed and ritually cleansed by the water. But that night I just threw myself on the ground and I cried out to God, whoever would hear me, and said, God, I know you hate me, because that's what I believe. And I said, just show me the way to you. Show me the way I can find favor with you, earn favor with you, please. She cried herself to sleep that night, and that night she had a dream that forever changed her life. She dreamed it was the end times, and in her dream, she looked out a window, and the sky was opening, and a, a man glorious in white robe, his face like lightning, appeared her. Now, you understand, she's never read the Bible. <laughs> I mean, she's hadn't read the Christian Bible before. Um, and it was Jesus, she realized. And, and this led her on a long process and journey of finding out who Jesus was. And now she's a Christian counselor. She follows Jesus. This brings us back to the core Christian brothers and sisters of what the kingdom gospel is. And I, I need you to understand this. I want you to understand this. This is the gospel, the kingdom gospel at its heart includes this. Jesus, the king, saves us from ourselves. Jesus, the king, saves us from ourselves. He saves us, yes, from our sin, but he saves us from the root of sin, which is trying to be our own gods and saviors. Or if you're a parent, perhaps it's trying to be your own child's god and savior. I, I, I'm his mama, so therefore I'm obviously the god and savior. I need to figure out what to do. <laughs> no, please don't go there. Uh, Satan loves that. You know, if you'll just eat of this fruit of the tree, you will become like God, knowing good and evil. And you'll be grown up and able to make all your own choices. And Satan says, I have just innumerable choices for you. That's, that's Genesis chapter 3, verse 4. But fortunately, we also have Genesis 3.15 after the fall, 
when the Lord curses the serpent, he gives us what's called the proto-evangelion. I will put enmity between your seed, the serpent, and her seed. He will crush your head. You will strike his heel. The, the son of the woman, the incarnate son, will prevail. But don't try to be your own God. Don't try to be your children, your grandchildren's God. And please do not do the flyby or drive through Jesus thing. I'm busy, God. I'm really busy, but I'll give you a minute right here. If you'll help me out a little bit, you know, hey, yeah, I'm trying. I'm being spiritual too. In my thousand things I'm going to do today, I'm going to work Jesus in as maybe two of the thousand. This is not the way to live. Don't stand over Jesus either. That's not the right posture. Do not stand over Jesus. Unloading on him all your ideas, your thousand ideas about how to make the world better and how to fix all the people in your life. Now, can we bring anything to God? Absolutely, but that is not the place to start. That is not the place to start to unload all my ideas on him so that he can snap to and start doing what I've already figured out. That is not, or, or just respond to all my worries or cares. He's not called to live by your word. You are called to live by his word. Let me repeat that. He is not called to live by your word. You're called to live by his word. Sit at the Lord's feet. Lose yourself and find yourself in him. Hear and live by his word. So, of course, classically, we have Martha the controller. Does anybody know a control freak or anybody who's kind of close to being a control freak? So that's, this is Martha. Insist on serving and serving the Lord and her family her way. She is actually a doer of the law, doing before and above listening. She's, got, she's way too busy to slow down, right? She's going to get it done her way. She is anxious, so that means internally she's all torn up. And then it bears out externally, right? She is troubled on the outside, too, and clamoring. The, the Greek here could actually be translated clamoring. She's clamoring all over the place about many things. She's angry at Mary, but you know where this is going, right? Is Mary really the big problem? No. She's angry at Jesus. Our ultimate problem is with God. Sin is ultimately vis-a-vis -vis God, right? And our complaints are ultimately vis-a-vis -vis God, if we're certainly anywhere close to being believers. And the term that's used here that the Greek term is kind of interesting. It's not really translated, that, but epistaza, that actually means to stand upon. I mean, she's going over and standing. She's, she's standing upon Jesus, right? Because he doesn't answer her prayers her way. This is obviously, God is obviously a failure if he doesn't run the world the way you want him to run it, right? Uh, he doesn't answer her prayers her way. So he obviously doesn't care. And he needs to be pushed. We need to push him to get Jesus in action here, right? Years ago, when I was actually probably 20-something years ago, when I was pastoring a new church that was growing a lot, we had a lot of young people, a lot of young couples. I was doing a lot of pastoral counseling and premarital counseling with a lot of 20s and 30-somethings. And I came across this book that at the time I think was relatively new, Stormy O'Marthian. She's not Presbyterian. She's kind of in a different realm of uh, the church world. But I loved her book, The Power of a Praying Wife. And in the opening part of that book, she talks about it. And so this I used in all kinds of counseling, all kinds of couples and women and moms. Um, Power of the Praying Wife. She talks about the fact that she thought she was a believer. And she'd been going to church her whole life. And she's in a, in a marriage that's challenged. Her husband is not you know, living up to what he needs to live up to, not being the leader he needs to be. I think she has young kids at the time. And she prayed for months, maybe for years, change him, Lord. Change him. She'd also say, save our marriage. Fix our children. Fix our household. And then suddenly she was converted. The Lord spoke to her, and her prayer totally changed. Her prayer became, change me, Lord. 
and then changed, lead me to serve your purposes with the rest. It's a massive difference. It's the difference between being a Christian and honestly praying like a pagan. So, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God. So, there is Mary at Jesus' feet. But Martha has to interrupt. She comes up to Jesus. She stands to put him to the test. Just like the Torah expert stood to put Jesus to the test. You're getting the connection here. I mean, they're the same. Uh, Martha is not maybe an expert in Torah, but she is an expert in the law of we, the way we do things in our family and the law of the way I think they ought to be and the law of the way my grandmama taught me and the law of the way we do things in this church. You better get with it, Jesus. You better do it because this is the way we do it in this church. You're our guest, Jesus, but you better snap too, right? Because this is the way we do it. This is the way we do it. So she's an expert in that kind of law. And she stands up to challenge Jesus to make him obey the way we do things, the way it ought to be done. Know anybody like that? Compare again Peter's doing before listening back at the transfiguration, right? He's ready to jump in and do before he actually listens. And what is God's one command to him? This, can, this is basically the central command of our lives as Christian. Hey, Jesus is the king. He's my son. He's the chosen one. Shut up and listen to him first. Listen to him. Out to Akuate, right? That's the command. These, these are the words. When you get words from the Father from heaven in a gospel, you better pay attention to them. And these are key. Listen. Akuate. It's an imperative. So we get then God's rebuke of Peter. We'll come back to Jesus' rebuke, loving rebuke, of Martha in a moment, but first let's look at Mary having set down. The Greek, uh, the Greek here it means like she's decisively set down. Okay? It's, it's in the aorist participle. At, at the feet of King Jesus. Listening. You get that connection, right? Ekuen, it's the same verb base as what God commanded Peter. This is, she's doing what God says you need to do, she's listening. She's sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to his word. Literally, it's his word. So, let me explain this to you. To sit at the feet of a teacher means you are under his authority. It means, by the way, you are accepted by him as well. You're accepted to be his disciple. So, all through the scriptures, this is what this means. For instance, back in the Old Testament, just one example. The sons of the prophets in 2 Kings chapter 4, during the famine, they are sitting at the feet of Elisha. When Paul gives his testimony in Acts chapter 23 about his life, he gives his background, his cred as a Jewish Pharisee and teacher. He says, I was educated where? Acts 23.3. At the feet of Gamaliel. This is, this is an accepted, like, high-level disciple. Now, ladies, you catch this. This is radical in the first century. No other Jewish rabbi has women disciples sitting at his feet. Jesus does. I've preached about this on other Sundays in this series. But understand this. She is... Now, Jesus, to go to his feet in Luke's gospel means you are believing in him. Back, for instance, Luke chapter 8, right? Jairus, when he goes, begs Jesus to heal his daughter, who it turns out is dead. Jesus is going to raise her from the dead. What does he do? He falls at Jesus' where? Feet. The woman with the flow of blood in the same you know, sequence, right? What does she do? She goes on the ground and touches the fringe of his garment at his feet. So this is a sign of trusting totally in him as a child, okay, coming to the life giver, and also the disciple. Uh, Jesus lets people come to his feet that just are unheard of. You remember that Gentile demoniac that Jesus delivers, the Gerizim demoniac? Well, what happens afterwards? The people come and they're freaked out because they see the guy who used to be so crazy and violent at peace. And where is he? Guess. Sitting at Jesus's feet. Okay, so we're supposed to catch in. Jesus just lets like Gentiles, former demoniacs, a Samaritan's going to be at his feet 
in Luke chapter 17, which is beautiful gospel stuff. But um, of course, uh, Martha has much more important things to deal with, you know, that kind of person. So she, she needs to interrupt all this. She comes up, stands over Jesus, uh, and she's got to get into the system. She's got to stand against the discipleship of her sister. You know, unfortunately, some of the people who oppose your discipleship most may be in your own family. For all I know, it may be your big sister. I mean, literally, I don't know. I don't know who it is. But here we have someone, Mary, who is trusting like a little child in Jesus, submitting, this is what it means to be a Christian, to trust him in saving faith, to submit to his authority. He's the king. The kingdom is at hand, right? And to be focused on his word, hearing, actually hearing his word, taking it to heart. Not just showing up and kind of going through the rituals like Kinsa Haddock used to do. I'm talking about like actually hearing his work. And doing this in order then to keep and do his work. Undividedly belonging to him. Not pulled in 5,000 different directions. Undividedly belonging to him. Submit, not having a divided heart. Like the scripture says, you cannot have a divided heart. Your heart belongs to him. Not to others and their agendas. Women, does anyone want to be set free from everybody else's agenda for you? Well, Jesus is the one to do it. To be at peace. See, Mary is a free woman now, vis-a-vis -vis others, even vis-a-vis -vis her controlling sister. So notice what Mary does not need to do. Do we get a, an account? Does Luke go on for five chapters about all their back and forth fighting and spitting at each other? She doesn't need to say a thing. Did you catch this? But she has total agency. We're told in our culture, Women, you need to have agency, so you need to talk more, and you need to post more on social media, and you need to really express yourself all the time. It's like, no, no, no. The one who actually has real agency in this is the one who can stay quiet because she trusts in Jesus, and he will defend her, and he's her advocate, okay? So she's at peace. She, she's free from fighting and defensiveness and people-pleasing. She doesn't speak to justify herself. She lets Jesus justify her. That's the gospel. We're justified not by ourselves, but by him, right? So she's at peace with him, able to enjoy worship, able to glorify him and enjoy him forever. What a concept. She is listening, not unloading all her own thoughts and agendas. She's focused on his love and loving him being shaped by his word, not her thousand plus feelings and thoughts and agendas and fears for the given moment. So back to our friend Martha, though, we need to come back to her. This is loving rebuke. Okay, it's loving, but it's rebuke and redirection. When, and Jesus uses the doubling. I can tell you in the Bible, in brief, when you get the double, you're really supposed to pay attention. Abraham, Abraham, don't sacrifice the boy. Okay? Um, when Jesus says to Simon, 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 Satan has asked to sift you. So I'm really better pay attention to that. Um, when Saul, we know as Paul, is going to Damascus to persecute the Christians, the Lord Jesus in glory strikes him down, and what does he say? Saul, Saul, twice. And here we have it to Martha. Not as dramatic, but it's the same kind of thing, the doubling, right? And notice this, Jesus does not reply to Martha's words, but to their meaning. Martha, Martha, you're anxious about many things. Kenneth Bailey, in his commentary on Jesus through Middle Eastern eyes, says, Jesus says basically, look, I, I, I know the whole list. I'm the Lord God. I, I get it that you have a thousand different things you need to do. But one thing is needed. What is missing is not one more plate of food or one more social grace from you. I'm not going to allow you to take what actually matters from your sister. I am the Lord your God. A good student is more important to me than a good meal or a good work. Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled, clamoring about many things. One thing. But notice this now, that the Greek here is actually not literally one. It's not mia or mion, it's oligon, which literally means small. I think I've got it up on the screen for you. So I, I kind of like the small thing. 
go small. Obviously, we're going to get to the one thing, but we need to be smaller in our lifestyle and in our schedule. Go small, subtract and focus, and then through the going small, go to the one thing that matters. Let me say this as a side note, because a lot of monastics through the years have used this, oh, well, obviously you need to be a contemplative hermit your entire life. That's not what's going on here. Mary is acting and is going to act, but her first act needs to be to go to Jesus and listen to him. First, Luke emphasizes that Mary is acting. She's chosen, decisively chosen. And by the way, decisively chosen not to get into it with Martha. She's going to let Jesus justify her. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus says, Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken from her in this life or in eternity. Jesus directs us, I think, in this conversation, the kind of terminology he uses to the man after God's own heart, which is David. Remember Psalm 16, verse 5. The Lord is, my David says, chosen portion and my cup. We're coming to the Lord's table in a few minutes. You hold my lot, which doubles down on the fact that he's talking about inheritance. Eternal inheritance. So subtract and focus to get there. David also, look at this, Psalm 27. You know, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Look at verse 4. One thing I have asked of the Lord. One thing. One thing I have asked of the Lord. That will I seek. In almost all the translations, is to dwell in the Lord's house, but literally, shapti, okay, is from yeshav, which literally means to sit, to sit, just like Mary, right? To sit in the Lord's house all my life's days, to gaze upon the Lord's beauty, and to inquire, in other words, to learn in his temple. Mary sat at the Lord's feet. And then the Psalm of Asaph, we've already Cover that, but whom have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth I desire besides you. Christian, do you really want to see Jesus in heaven, or is it just some people you actually love? I hear all the time, well, I want to see this person or that person I actually love. I would suggest you refocus and think about Jesus first in the age to come. Um, nothing on earth I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail. The strength of my heart and my portion is God. My portion is God forever. So the disciple hears his word and does it then in kingdom mission. Jesus says in Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, blessed rather are those who hear the word, number one, and keep it. Keep it, that means doing it, but also holding on to it. Melvin Tinker says the problem with Martha is that in all her busyness, she has placed herself outside the sphere of God's word. Don't do that. Before we can first serve Jesus, we need to hear him. Hear him and then act, not the other way around. So finally, speaking of Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus over in John's gospel, remember John 11, Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. They're in Bethany. And then let's go to the next chapter, John 12, verses 2 and 3. So they gave a dinner for him there at Bethany. Martha served. Any surprise on that? Um, and Lazarus, one of those, he's been raised from the dead now, reclining with him at table. Mary, here's, here's her key act in the entire story, right? Mary took a pound of very expensive perfume, a pure nard, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. And then you may remember Judas Iscariot throws a fit about this, and Jesus says, in verse 7, Jesus says, leave her alone. Now notice, again, Mary doesn't argue with Judas Iscariot. Jesus is going to justify her. Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. Now, all kinds of interpreters get all kind of confused about this because she's already done the perfume on Jesus' feet, so how is she going to keep the perfume? Is she going to somehow try to recapture it off of his... No, no, no. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about what you've just learned about. She will keep the portion forever. 
And the day of his burial means all the way through in the season Jesus is in to save her in the day of his coming to Jerusalem and going all the way through the cross to the resurrection. That's what's actually going on in that verse. So today I want to invite you to love the Lord with everything you are and then to act on that love, hearing his word, sit at his feet, lose yourself in him and find yourself in him. That's what communion is about. And live by his word. Women, what's your place? Choosing what lasts at his feet forever, the portion. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.